Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Nick Talley. Some of you have heard of me, some of you haven't, some of you will. Um, let me ask you, who's from the University of New South Wales in the audience? UNSW, anybody from UNSW? Not a soul? <laughs> Not a, that's my alma mater, ladies and gentlemen. It's the only university, the only medical school in the country that does not recommend Tally and O'Connor. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I must say they recommend one of the UK textbooks you may have heard of. They're not very good though, they're not very good. You may have heard of those, uh, but regardless, apparently some of the students, in fact many I believe, still buy our textbook, which I'm pleased about. And by the way, I'm very happy to sign any editions uh, uh, <laughs> whatsoever, except uh, one to seven. Eight's good. No, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. All right, so I was asked to say a few words about how I got here. Now, I think they meant not how I got here physically, but uh, my career, how I ended up becoming uh, a medical professional with an interest in education and research. And I'd like to tell you folks, I think I've got one of the best jobs in medicine. I really, really mean it. And it's because I'm an academic. And because that means I can do almost, and don't tell anybody, I can do almost whatever I like during my workday. I'm actually being serious. Yes, I've got some accountability. Yes, I have to travel all over the world and give lectures. It's just awful. It's just terrible. Every minute is torture. Look at me in the White House over here. <laughs> awful. Look at me with Barry Marshall from Western Australia, the Nobel Laureate. Just awful. I just have a terrible time. It's just every day is a misery. Every day is just, I get to see the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize medal uh, for Australia recently. And I got to meet the Governor General recently. Yes, look, it's just an awful job. Don't tell anybody, but there's a shortage of academics. Yes, there'll be lots of jobs. Don't tell anybody, because th there might suddenly be a change. So don't tell anybody, please. OK, and how did I get here? Well, look, it's a little bit of luck and a little bit of mentorship, a lot of mentorship, actually, and seriously, a bit of hard work. But I guess I'd like to tell you at least what I feel is my personal secret in terms of career success. I actually love what I do. Every day's fun, except when I have to rewrite the textbook. Every day, <laughs> most days anyway, are really, really enjoyable. I practice medicine, I do research, I educate, I do do some leadership stuff, and I put up with administration, which I absolutely hate. But anyway, one does it. Okay, now, OSCEs, OSCEs. Let's talk about this very quickly because I know you have absolutely no interest. It's convention. OSCEs? Oh my goodness, do you really have to talk about work? And I'll try and go through it very quickly. I'll tell you some secrets about OSCEs, some secrets that you're not allowed to tell anyone else. No social media allowed, and don't tell anyone from UNSW, please. Not a soul. <laughs> not a soul. Let's talk about some of these. Firstly, OSCEs test core competencies. That's not just medical knowledge, although you have to know something. By the way, secret number one, you don't have to know much. Not much at all, actually, to be perfectly honest. Now, don't tell them, don't tell my colleagues who educate, who would tell you, very serious, very serious, you know a lot, and it is. You need to know something, just not too much. Um, in terms of other core competencies, it's about clinical skills. That means basically practicing a little bit of medicine and showing you can do it. And I'll take you through what that means in a minute. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It also means communicating, folks, communication. Now, convention is all about communication. I don't want to know any details, <laughs> none at all, not even one. But it is about communication, this time between patient and 
medical student, patient and doctor. And in some OSCEs, you'll have other competencies tested as well. But as you can see, OSCEs are all about this. But hang on, hang on, hang on. How do you learn to do all of this? How do you actually learn to be competent? Well, you can learn some things from a textbook. Of course, mine's the best. You should always read that one. <laughs> of course, of course. But, but actually what it means is being out there with patients and seeing what your role models do well and watching out when your role models don't do it so well. So it's about learning in the classroom. Now, what's an OSCE? It's an Objective Structured Clinical Examination. Basically, every medical school does it differently or a little bit differently. Isn't that confusing? So I guess the first thing is work out what your medical school does and uh, learn the local rules. But typically, in a final exam, for example, you might have 10 or 20 stations of 10 or 15 minutes each where they'll test a particular skill or competency, a particular area. And I'll take you through a few examples in a moment. But I mean, the details don't matter so much. It's basically, though, absolutely critical. You realize sometimes they're real patients and sometimes they're fake patients, fake news. And the fake patients, they're the tough ones. They're the tough ones, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So this is an example from a UK OSCE, but it's very similar here, uh, where there'll be a number of different stations. This is a so-called final exam in the UK system. It was the best example I could find, though. And basically, a number of different stations being tested, from a clinical examination to taking a history to how you'd prescribe intravenous fluids, for example. How you might break bad news to a patient, something like that. So, you know, uh, and sometimes I'll also lump all this stuff together um, in terms of how they mark it. We'll come back to the marking in a moment. By the way, what's this young lady's problem? Just looking at her face. What do you reckon it is? Lupus, Malar Rash. Could it only be lupus? Very brilliant group over here, whoever they are. They must be from Western Australia, right, guys? Is that correct? <laughs> no, no. Um, any other, any other, any others in the differential diagnosis you might think about? Anybody come up with anything? Rosacea. Rosacea, good idea, very well said. So an OSCE test skills, and basically this is the list of the kind of skills it will test. It's supposed to be testing your competence to be a doctor. That's what it's supposed to be doing. And that's indeed the goal of the so-called OSCE. And look at this, I love this. This again came from the, a, a UK journal, but a very interesting, uh, uh, no, nonetheless, uh, piece of paper. If you look at the person receiving the intravenous uh, f infusion there, that's not a real arm. That's a fake arm. And you get to put the line in, in the fake arm. And look at the fake melanoma on the other side of the slide, stuck on a patient, a fake melanoma to test your knowledge of skin conditions. Don't we all love diagnosing skin conditions? Aren't they easy, ladies and gentlemen? Aren't they easy? Yeah, I know, I know. All right, so um, how do you pass? That's all you care about, right? You don't care about the skills, you don't care about the competency, you don't care about being a doctor, you just care about passing, right? Correct? Well, maybe. All right, maybe, maybe, maybe. So what are they trying to test in here? OK. First of all, secret number two, the examiners want to pass you. In fact, it's enormously hard to fail you. It is. It's hard to fail you. Mind you, some people try really hard. <laughs> they work at it to perfection to almost fail. My suggestion is, if you're one of them, change. <laughs> you actually want to be a competent doctor, probably. I hope, I hope. And if you don't want to be a competent doctor, think about medical administration. It's a perfect field. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm only joking. I, some of my best friends are 
excellent medical administrators and we need those people too. So what are they going to test? They're going to test your skills. They're going to make sure you're safe. If you prescribe a drug that will kill the patient, that is not safe. That is not. That will be a problem. So don't do that. Just don't do it. Okay. It's about common problems, common conditions. It's about basically practicing and practicing, and we'll come back to that. And not just learning checklists. And by the way, probably one of the best ways to study for OSCEs, any clinical exam, form a study group. Now, selection of your partners in the study group, the best people. Find the best people. If they're all used up, I don't know what you do, but find the best people and work with them and practice together and raise your group competency and all of you will do well. But it's very hard to fail, that's secret number two. So you need to be systematic, you need to know what to do, you need to learn a system and some of you who've read my textbook and other similar textbooks will notice they have the systems in the book. But you need, each of you, to develop your own system. Just make sure it's not so radical that the examiners haven't got a clue what you're doing. Because remember, they're marking you and they've all read my book too. I'm sorry, they have. <laughs> well, most of them. Well, some of them, many of them. All right. So the don'ts. Well, you're doing an exam, come fresh. Bring your favorite stethoscope, not the one you bought today that you can't hear anything through. I've seen that. Um, read the instructions on the station. Be nice to the patients. Actually, be nice to everybody. In fact, when you're practicing in the wards, be nice too. If you're nice all the time, the exam becomes second nature. Don't try to be nice only on exam day. It doesn't always work. Be nice. Now expose the patient. Don't say, oh, I'm so sorry I'm exposing you. Oh, I'm so sorry I'm exposing you. Oh, I'm so, 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 so sorry that I'm exposing you. Can you imagine a doctor doing that? They would look silly. Don't look silly. Do it sensibly like they do in real life. And don't worry if you can't work out the diagnosis. Sometimes the examiners don't have a clue either. Um, and finally, one hint when you're doing more advanced exams is don't make anything up seriously. Better to say you don't know than to start saying really silly, perhaps even dangerous things. Remember, if you're a danger to society, they may not pass you. <laughs> and then in some exams, it depends on your medical school, the simulated patients rate you as part of the assessment. They actually rate if you're any good as a doctor, not what your clinical uh, knowledge is or how good you are at doing the exam in a smooth, beautiful way. They grade you for your professionalism. And they're tough, so be nice. That's all, be nice, it's easy. And in fact, I think it's part of professionalism that you do behave in a way that reassures people. How do they mark the exam? Oh, it's great fun. Here it is, borderline regression method. Would you like me to take you through it? No, 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 okay, let me, let me be real simple. You, the assessors have a checklist and they mark everything off. And then the assessors say, was they a good candidate or a poor candidate or somewhere in the middle? And then they hope that the marks on one side match up with their global assessment on the other, and where the line goes together, that's the pass mark. And basically, you've got to do better than, you know, you've got to be at least at a certain level of, of, of uh, competence to pass that particular station. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it just depends on what they think of you overall. That's really what they're marking, despite all the complexities of the marking system. That's secret number three. And secret number four, the secret to passing, no secret. Practice, practice, practice. I'm not sure why my slide disappeared, but that's all right. Taking the blood pressure. There was a study in the United States of medical students taking the blood pressure and performing all the critical steps. One out of 140 passed every single step. 
The rest of them missed multiple steps, several important things. And by the way, in an OSCE, if you've never taken a blood pressure manually, you will not pass. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You will fail. You just have to practice. Taking a blood pressure is basic stuff. You can do it. And by the way, just for fun, to show you some, something interesting, sorry, it was one out of 159. I got my numbers wrong, but anyway, there's the reference. But there are certain things that can help the accuracy and raise your score in an OSCE. Like if you tell patients to sit up straight, don't cross their legs, don't talk to you, which is great. Um, cuff on the bare arm, use the right cuff size, and ask them if they've emptied their bladder. That scores in the stratosphere for a blood pressure loss. In the stratosphere. Wow, I wish I'd known that when I did mine. My goodness. So there you go. By the way, read that study. It's a great study, and it lists all the steps you should know for taking a manual blood pressure. And you can educate the examiners on how to do it properly. Okay? Because some of them don't know. But don't tell them I told you. That's secret number five. Observation, ladies and gentlemen, it's all about observation. So look, I'm a gastroenterologist, so I like doing gastrointestinal examinations because I can remember what's wrong with people then. Um, and it's really good. So what's, uh, what, what are these nails, these white nails? What could they be in someone with a gastrointestinal problem? What might that mean? Anybody know? Shout out, anybody? Leukonychia, white nails, hypoalbuminemia. Isn't it easy? Clinical medicine's a breeze. I know. What's this one? <laughs> it's on the slide, but don't read it. What's this one? These have got dark lines and then white nails. They're half and half nails. They are from... Anybody? Terry's nails from... Oh, my goodness. Who's read my textbook? Not a soul. Okay, I know it's convention. Chronic kidney disease. Terry's nails. There you go. Who was Terry? I can't remember. Anyway. <laughs> Who knows? Jupitron's contractures. What's that from, ladies and gentlemen? Differential of Jupitron's contractures. You know where your hand's got this nice little... Alcohol, thank you. Any others? Just alcohol? They're all alcoholics by definition, every moment. Is, is an alcoholic? Yes? No, it's not true. What else can do it? Yeah, trauma's a big one. Trauma's a very common cause. Well said. What's this? Ladies and gentlemen, come on, I've only got two minutes left. You've got to rush. You've got to rush. It's a mouth ulcer. Oh, gosh, that's hard. Okay, but what could cause it? What could cause it? Idiopathic. Yes. <laughs> Don't we know a lot? Idiopathic, the commonest cause of mouth ulcers. Oh, boy, boy, it's tough, isn't it? Medicine's just awful. What's this rash? This rash, anybody know? She's got diarrhea. Oh, yeah, she does. She has diarrhea and a rash on her elbows here. Yeah, no, she does. And what do you think? Anybody? Anybody? Yes, dermatitis herpetiformis in celiac disease or certainly gluten enteropathy. So that's what she's got and that's important. And look at this patient, very normal. One of my normal patients come in to the hospital. What do you think? What do you think? Anybody? Ah, cirrhosis and chronic liver disease. I heard it over here. Another UWA group over here. Very good. They're everywhere. <laughs> Amazing. And look at the saddle nose deformity here. Beautiful differential diagnosis. Used to be called Wegner's granulomatosis. Why was Wegner dropped off the list? My goodness, he was there and then he was gone. Why was he dropped off 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Yes, he would join the Nazi party. Actually, according to the histories, he was, a, he was in the Nazi party, but didn't actually do any atrocities that are known anyway. However, they still dropped him like a hot potato. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, is this a normal abdomen or not? Normal or not? Abnormal. What can cause this? Big abdomen, big abdomen. Come on, big abdomen. What can do it? Seven causes now, quick. Seven, seven, fat. Fat, feces and flatus, perfect, that's three. Phantom pregnancy, oh my goodness. What else? Fetus, I've heard fetus. Filthy big tumor with an F. Filthy, filthy big tumor. 
fluid, ladies and gentlemen. This patient actually has chronic liver disease. Look at their veins on the abdomen. They're quite abnormal. And they're moving in these directions away from the umbilicus because of portal hypertension. Yes, yes, very, gee, what a clever group. And there they are. Look, if you couldn't remember any of them, here they are. And what an easy list. Isn't medicine a breeze? Come on, anyone can pass an OSCE. Anybody can do it. It's true, actually, it's true. All right, I'm about out of time. Oh, but I mean, if you want to know how to do things, um, I was going to give you all of this information, but I'm just about out. But let me ask you this one. The OSCE for diabetes. You get a diabetic foot, okay? Where are you going to start your examination? At the hands? At the face? At the belly? At the feet, because that's where the money is. And in fact, the reason we uh, use this, uh, I love this quote from Willie Sutton, who was a famous bank robber in the United States. He robbed banks uh, in the 40s and 30s, made $2 million, spent half his life in jail. And when he was asked, why does he rob banks? He told you, because that's where the money is. And for Oskies, you need to think about Willie Sutton. If I'm asked to examine somewhere, where's the money? I go there, not somewhere else. Where the money is. Listen to the stem, makes it easy. OSCEs are a breeze. The feared neurological case, I loved neurological cases, but your examiners are all hope, no, not all, many of them, know less about this than you do. Just think that, well, maybe. Um, so be confident, and just remember there's lots of other stations you'll be able to go to that won't, <laughs> you'll, do, you'll do a lot better. Okay, but in fact, neurology in OSCEs is usually really straightforward. Peripheral neuropathies, not complex, for example. Uh, a simple cranial nerve. You have to know a little bit of neuroanatomy. I'm really sorry, folks, but even in clinical practice, you have to know a little anatomy. I'm sorry, it's true. And if you do it, you'll do well. So what's wrong with OSCEs? The trouble with OSCEs are they're fake. Who comes in and says, I have a sore foot and here's my ulcer and please examine me? Who does that? Which, what patient does that? It's not a real case. It's not the way patients always present in the real world. That's the main problem and that's the way it is. But you can't fail. Look, you almost can't fail. If you're systematic, if you show your clinical skills, if you wash your hands coming and going, gosh, don't forget that, that's so basic. If you're nice, by the way, if you hurt the patient, you just might have done some damage to yourself. Don't do that, don't hurt the patient. Act professionally, make sure you're safe. The facts, much less relevant. Okay, and then eventually as you practice these skills, you'll actually grow in wisdom. I won't take you through this because I'm done, um, but let me say this. Uh, these are copies of the photographs of the uh, original textbooks, uh, edition number one. Uh, a little bit older, a little bit different to the current edition but I thought you'd like to see them anyway. And look, it's a great privilege to be here to talk to you. You're the future of our profession. You really matter. What you do will make a real difference in the world. Please go and do it. Thank you. Nick, thank you so much for such a hugely entertaining and educational talk. Pleasure. I'll just join you some questions now. So it's a fitting final slide you had because the first question comes from someone who's curious about your Taekwondo. <laughs> this says, hi Why Nick. I always get asked about that. <laughs> Big fan of Tally and O'Connor and I enjoy a lot of the humorous elements while I find it myself reading it late at night prepping last minute for an assessment. When reading the upper limb neuro exam chapter, I noticed a footnote, footnote detailing how you've won black belts in Taekwondo <laughs> and Tang Sudo. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about this. 
Uh, yes. So, so I, I don't pretend to be a, an expert martial artist, but I do have black belts in those styles. Uh, <laughs> I was the New South Wales Tank Sudo uh, team champion. I won't give you the year. It was a long time ago. Uh, there weren't many people practicing tank pseudo, so that made it really easy to be the team <laughs> champion, let's be honest. Um, and I used to love it. it used to, you know what I used to like the most? I had a really bad day and I'd go and train. Nothing better than whacking that bag and thinking about some of the things that uh, you've had to deal with. So nothing, nothing better than that. But that's just my personal journey. It was a way to de-stress, at least for me. Nick, how did you have the confidence to write the textbook that definitively describes examination? Where did you collect your information from? Okay, so that's a long story, but I'll, I'll try and shorten it. Um, <clears throat> so after I passed the fellowship of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians exam, which is a really tough exam, in fact it was, uh, well, I, we always think it's harder in our day, of course. It was tough, it was a tough exam, very, very difficult exam in the days we sat it. Simon and I tr studied together, passed the exam, and I'd written all these notes. I had this, I had boxes, boxes of cards with information on examining everything, every differential you could ever imagine I had summarized out of various sources in the literature. And I didn't want to just throw it out. I thought, oh my goodness. So I said to Simon at the celebration drinks, you know, I'm going to write a textbook. Do you want to join me? And he foolishly said yes, and then we started. <laughs> That's history. We were registrars, so we had not fully trained yet, but we were not medical students, so we'd, we'd had, some, obviously, we'd, we'd uh, gone through the registrar, you know, the more junior registrar phases before we started. It didn't Nick, take long to write, just a year, nothing. <laughs> Nick, everyone's asking about the guy who's always naked in your textbooks. <laughs> Say again, I, I'm sorry, I, obviously it was very funny, but... What the... Who is he and where is he now? <laughs> Our model? Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's a secret. I can't reveal that. That is, I am, I am not at liberty to do so. All I can tell you is he's very happy. <laughs> and we're very grateful he uh, is so popular on the internet. And we, <laughs> we, we, have, we have noticed uh, some, of the, some of the comments. <laughs> they have come to our attention. <laughs> I, I haven't told him, by the way, but anyway, no, that, that's, that's fine. Nick, do you think any medical student can accurately measure a JVP? <laughs> they can guess, <laughs> and they do. Um, look, you've just got to see the waves. You've actually got to look, you know, look, you know, look at the neck in a, with a bit of light and look, at, look for those waves, the A, V wave, just look. It's not an atrial fibrillation, you'll see it. You can't feel it, but when you look, it's there. That's how you tell. It's not that hard. I know lots of more senior doctors who can't read a JVP either, so don't be embarrassed. Get your mentor to find a big JVP and show you it. Once you've seen it once, you won't forget. Don't be afraid to ask your role models and your mentors to train you. That's their job, <laughs> and they ought to do it well. Yeah. Have them train you. On the topic of signs, some studies have shown some examination techniques to be fairly um, useless. So the example here is Koenig's sign. Um, do you foresee writing some of these out of the book? Oh, uh, that's a very hard question. I mean, we're one of the first books, not the only one though, there have been others, but one of the first books to put in you know, likelihood ratios and, and, and sensitivity specificity information where we have it. We even commissioned a systematic review to obtain new information that we put into the last edition and we continue to update. But to be perfectly frank, it's very hard. The studies are, are crap. <laughs> They're not very good. Many of them are not very good. You guys need to do some research. Clinical skills testing the validity of clinical signs against gold standard techniques in cardiology, it's ultrasound, you know, it's echo, etc. It can be done, but there's not much out there, remarkably little. Yeah, we should write some of them out, you're absolutely right, but then the examiners complain, but we learned this in medical school and it should be in your textbook too. So we've got this dilemma. Which ones do we write out though? 
<laughs> you know, because if we write out the wrong one, <clears throat> that's a problem too. So we try to teach it and we try to allow people to form their own opinion based on the data that's available. Nick, we have one more question before it's time for your breakout. How can we audition to be the model in your next edition? <laughs> Ooh, oh, uh, the, the, ask Simon. Write to Simon. <laughs> He's in Canberra. <laughs> the Roy, you know. We'll write post to his Simon. details on the app. Thanks, All right. very much. Thanks, Nick. Thank Appreciate you your time. Much. Can we give another huge round of applause for Thank Nick? You. Thanks very much.